Hey, what's going on guys? It's Tom Mason here, back with episode two in the Camera Trap Diaries series. And today we're talking about the basic gear you're gonna need um, to get started in camera trapping. Now, um, let me get my bag stuff. This, uh, this is my camera trap bag. Um, this has everything I need inside um, for most of my camera trap projects. I mean, that's a bit of a lie because there's still quite a lot of stuff behind me. Um, but basically what is in here are the cameras, lenses, and all the other accessories that help me build camera traps. So let's kind of dive in and, and see what you basically need. Now, of course, to get started, you're gonna need a camera. And first up, I would say, get a camera that you don't mind losing. Um, if you've got an old camera lying about, I personally um, started camera trapping with my old D200, then my D300, um, and any camera I've kind of like, progress past, um, it's often instead of like selling it on as, as used, um, I'll just kind of draw it into the camera trap arsenal and then use it out in the field. But I have also invested in some other cameras, stuff like the Nikon D3000 uh, 300 here. Um, the reason behind this is it's a tiny little camera that has a great 24 megapixel sensor, um, you know, and in terms of its performance, it's, it's doing really well out in the field. Um, there's a couple of key things that I look for in a camera trap uh, camera. Firstly, the battery life is really important. Um, I've always found that Nikon cameras have really good battery life, and even on these smaller models, I can actually easily get two months um, kind of sleep time in the field when I'm using this correctly um, with the sensors that I'll talk more about in the next episode. Um, the first thing I do, of course, is navigate through and make sure that I'm on the um, shortest kind of wake time so that it will go to sleep after like 20 seconds or whatever it is, uh, and it will stay in standby mode until triggered by the sensor to wake up and take that shot. Now, next up, the lens. Um, you can use the really cheap 18 to 55 mils for camera trapping. There's absolutely no problem with them. You know, a lot of the time you can be stopped down to um, F8, F11, and really that's where these lenses shine. At 18 mil on a DX sensor, you're getting around about uh, 28 mil FX equivalent. Um, that's the kind of really perfect ballpark focal length for putting an animal in its landscape. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, I have used wider, such as the 12 to 24 and stuff like that. But a lot of the time, I do find that the 18 to 55 is more than adequate um, for what I'm doing out in the field. And, and it makes really great pictures. And at the end of the day, once the camera's in the right position, everything's set up, the lighting's great, um, and you're using like F11, um, you really can't notice the difference that much. And unless you want that super wide vista as part of your camera trap, an 18 to 55 is a really great place to start. And of course, at 50 quid, they're very affordable as well. Now, in terms of the settings that you're gonna use on your camera, um, you're gonna to want to be in manual or aperture priority. Manual mode, um, I would personally recommend if you are doing a lot of night stuff. Um, if you want those slower shutter speeds so you can get some star trails, anything like that, that's where manual mode is gonna be really useful. But Aperture priority is something that I use all the time when it's going to be a day and night camera trap. In aperture priority, what you're gonna do is you are basically gonna set your aperture to get your correct flash exposure and then dial in at least minus two underexposure uh, on the exposure compensation dial. And then through the day as the camera wakes up, it's gonna underexpose the background, letting your flashes expose correctly uh, for your animal and foreground, giving you those really nice shots without clipping the highlights. Um, that is pretty much what you wanna do. Now, the camera itself will be triggered by the sensor, um, something like one of these. Um, this is my scout trigger um, from Kinesis. This is brilliant but I'll talk more about that in the next episode. And this is going to wake the camera up. So as the animal passes through the sensor, it's going to wake the camera and then fire the shot depending on how you set the sensor. Now, with the camera being asleep, depending on the model, it might take a little bit before it wakes up and takes that shot. And that's why having it in manual is really key because what you don't want is for any of the autofocus features to be switched on because, you know, if it tries to focus when it's dark or anything like that, it's just gonna ruin it. And I've done it before, I've accidentally left it on autofocus, you come back and of course it's out of focus and everything is ruined. So you keep it on manual focus 
get everything set exactly where you want it and then you know take it off i often find that if you always set to rear button focus what you'll find is it can never focus um even if even if the camera was set wrong when the trigger triggers the actual trigger of the paw always would trigger autofocus on the shutter button so if it's set on the rear button it's never going to override that and try and focus the lens of course switch into um, you know manual focus on the lens if it's got it um, but if not in the body just turn it off um, and also turn off any image stabilization that you've got in the camera um, the reason for that is sometimes you can get shake on it that can just be really problematic and just give you a bit of blur on your images that you just don't want so basically keep everything off and keep it manual um, and use Using aperture priority for those day and nighttime shots um, but if you want the long exposures for you know having some detail in the background in a night shot you're gonna have to use a manual exposure um, to make sure that you can get that right um, but that's something we'll talk about in a future video right so that's the camera uh, next up you need a couple of flash guns right now in terms of flash guns you're going to need at least two, really. Um, one's gonna be your primary light and the second is going to be a fill. Um, but ideally for a proper camera trap setup, you would use three because one can be used as a backlight, rim light, um, to give that extra separation uh, in terms of your creature from its landscape. Now, these flashes are gonna be attached to your camera um, and they can be attached in a number of ways. Here in front of me, I have a hard wire setup. Now I personally favor a hard wire setup over a wireless trigger setup and that's simply because in terms of my testing I have found it to be far more efficient, far more effective and just to be honest much more reliable when working out in the field. You have a hard wired like SC28 that goes onto the top of the camera. You're gonna um, you know, stretch this out to your first flash gun. Then from your first flash gun you have a secondary um, cable, I think is an SC15 or SC29, um, and that runs to another of the flash adapters. This is an AS10. I will put everything in the description because it'll make it easier. Um, and then this connects to your second flash. And then of course, when you've got a third flash, you run another cable out from this to another AS10 that is on the bottom of your flash. Now, the reason why this is important is because with these flash guns, uh, these are SB28s, they will wake up immediately when the camera is triggered. Um, they manage to hold their charge for a lot longer than other flash guns that basically means that they don't have to charge up and then fire when they've been asleep for a long time. That means that as the animal walks through, you get that immediate shot um, that you kind of want with the camera trap. Funny things in terms of wired setups, problems are that they can be a little bit bulky to get into position. Of course, you've got a lot of wires that get in the way. Um, and of course, they're quite, rodent susceptible if you're in an area where you've got a lot of rats anything like that sometimes they will just nibble through the cables and everything won't work additionally the wires also are a little bit more complex than just buying them and sticking them in because what you have to do is actually re-solder part of them uh, to make sure that they're going to work now the as10 if i can take it off what it has to have is you remove all four screws on the bottom and then you change the pin, the white to red. Um, and the reason you have to do that is so that it will ground itself and it won't continually keep the last flash switched on. Because at the end of the day, these flashes, the key is that you want them to go to standby mode so that when they're out in the field, they get a really long um, time without losing battery power. Now you can, of course, use flashes um, with them just on, but it does mean you're gonna get maybe one night at a maximum, two nights really at a push before they're dead and you're gonna have to swap the batteries out. And that's why having flashes that go to sleep is really key for a long-term uh, camera trap project. Now the SP28 is a very well-known flash for this. Um, there's a lot of details online about how you can do it. Um, but for me, I personally find it really simple to just use the AS10s and then when you attach back to the uh, camera itself, what you actually have to do is put a small piece of tape on the uh, flash adapter. And the reason for this is to stop the connecting ground pin um, from hitting the camera. And it basically means that instead of it staying awake the whole time, the whole system will go to sleep. Now, if you want something a little bit simpler, um, 
for the past how you do this, I will link an ebook um, that is just phenomenal for, for this um, in the description. But if you want something a little bit similar, you can get a wireless setup. Now there's a couple of options that do work, um, a couple of trimmers, there's one called Comlight. Um, basically, they have TTL wake up. That means that your camera flashes um, will wake up before they fire for the first time. You'll find that a lot of cheaper um, wireless alternatives, um, you know, wireless radio triggers, what they do is the first trigger of the camera, they'll wait the flashes, and then the second shot, um, it will actually fire both flashes and you'll get the correct exposure. Now that isn't a problem necessarily if you're gonna use um, a simple camera trap setup, say you're on manual and you're using 200th of a second, you'll find that you get one, two, and then on the second one, it'll open. It just means that the first shot of every kind of batch of camera trap pictures you take, you're gonna get a black frame. And if you're getting stuff that's only walking through once every kind of like three months, you really want it to work first time. And that's why the kind of more tricky situation of just, you know, getting it right and rewiring all the cameras just makes a lot of sense. And if that's something that you're not interested in, then the certain wireless triggers that will do it for you definitely make sense investing in. I've used them in the past and the only problem I've had with them is the battery life just isn't good enough for some of the long-term stuff I do. But if you're only gonna put stuff out for a week or so, they are more than capable. Um, I'll link them in the description so you know which ones to get. It's very important to get a certain type because if they won't wake the flashes, um, it just won't go off and you won't get any exposure. Now, you know, don't stress about getting SB28s, you know, as an absolute, because I know they're pretty difficult to find. You can, of course, use other um, flash guns. If you're a cannon shooter, a lot of the, um, what are they called, 580s, anything like that, they'll work absolutely perfectly as long as you have a trigger that will pre-wake the camera. Um, and of course, that pre-wake will trigger the flashes um, to come awake and charge up before the camera goes off. It's exactly the same for Nikon. You can do it with SB80s, SB800s, SB600s. They will all work fine as long as you can make sure that your camera wakes up and that will trigger the flashes to wake up and prepare to fire and then the next shot you're gonna get the image. And that's where a more expensive trigger um, can come in to make sure that you get that perfect shot. And I'll talk more about that in the next episode. You know, with all of this technology that you're kind of putting out into the field, you've got, you know, three flash guns, a camera, a trigger. One of the key things you need to think about is waterproofing to make sure that everything is gonna be safe. So let's, let's move that out of the way. Now for me personally, I use a range of Pelican houses. Now these are kind of ones that I've built myself. Um, and I've got ones here for flash guns uh, and I've got my camera bodies. Now, basically all this is, is a Peli 1550 case and then I've added an electrical junction box on the front and between that is a piece of pond liner um, that is then siliconed in inside to make a really nice tight waterproof shell. Now on the front, you'll see that it's currently open, but this is an 82 mil cutout that actually has the inlay so I can thread a filter inside. The reason I've used filters is because when they get all scratched up through use of the field that they will, I can just undo the filter, replace it with a new one, and then I've got a really tight camera trap box that can go out. Now this isn't completely waterproof, like it can't go underwater, but to fend off pretty much most stuff um, from day to day being outside, it's more than adequate. Now in terms of the flash guns, I've done a very similar thing. Uh, this is a Peli 1120 case. Um, you'll see that I've cut out the end um, and that basically is a piece of Perspex. And then inside I've modeled the foam to just fit my cameras, uh, my flash guns in. So basically they just stick inside, go like that, and then they shoot out the end. Now you'll see that they also have cutout sections at the back that the wires can kind of load through so that then once I've got it cinched down, it is a pretty formidable kind of box for the, uh, for the elements to get through. And I've left these out in the field for sometimes like 
months at a time, like two or three months at a time, um, and never had any problems of losing my flash guns, anything like that. You know, these are really, really rugged and great. And then of course, I've camoed them all up with some uh, spray paint. Now, one of the key things you've got to do as well is make sure you've got good attachments for a camera trap. Uh, so what I've done is I've got some aluminium plates that I've drilled through uh, and got one quarter threads. So this basically means that I can just thread it uh, to something like a super clamp, uh, and then I can pretty much position it anywhere I need to, uh, to get my flashes where I want. As you can see, we're starting to slowly amass quite an amount of gear just to get the camera out in the field. Now, of course, you don't have to have all this to cover your camera because what you can use is a plastic bag. And, you know, if you get some really good solid plastic bags, um, put them over your flash guns and then just, you know, cinch them down with a couple of cable ties it'll be more than adequate for fending off most of the rain. The reason that I've kind of invested a bit more in my system is because I leave them out for a long time and I also like them to be absolutely perfect and protected. And with the SB28s going up in price, I'm trying to look after them as best I can. Now, one of the other reasons the Peli case, uh, especially for the housing of the camera, is a good idea is because when it is inside the case, it makes the camera shutter noise a lot duller. Um, it really takes it from like a big click, click, click to a nice little duh, 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 that's really good for having less of an impact on your subject. Now, one of the other things I'll do to this is add a hood uh, when it goes outside just to stop any rain hitting that front lens because there's nothing more annoying than a little rain spot being in the way of the animal. Um, but overall, this is kind of the system I use. Um, if you'd like more information on how I actually build one of these, um, maybe I'll do a video on that so I'll show you actually one being constructed. But this is kind of my more advanced system for protecting stuff, but again, the plastic bag works as well. Right, so that's pretty much it. You need a camera, some cables to get to your flashes and some decent flashes that will wake from sleep. Um, I'll link to the fantastic ebook that can give you all the advice about how to do um, and change out the AS10s. Um, but yeah, the little hack on the uh, Nikons of the piece of tape, big shout out to uh, Terry Whitaker uh, for helping me out on that. Terry's a great photographer, does some awesome camera trap work, so go check him out. I'll drop a link in the description to Terry and his work. Um, but yeah, so that's the basics. And in the next episode, where I will still be in this shirt, we will talk about sensors and what and why I choose what I do. Right, so that's pretty much it for today. Thank you very much for joining me. If you've got any questions about this that I know they will, drop them in the comments below and I will get back to you. Thank you very much for watching. Join me again soon for another wildlife photography video. But that's it for this episode of Camera Trap Diaries. And in the next one, we're looking at sensors.